Hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon, and welcome to panel three of today's Art as Critique conference. I'll be responding to Professor Eliana Johnson's paper, An Expanse of Water, Ways of Knowing. Um, and before I turn off to Eliana, I'd like to introduce her. She's an associate professor of comparative literature and Spanish and Portuguese at UC Irvine. Um, she authored Sentencing um, Caminos of Alternity in the, in the Backlands of Brazil, published in 2010, and is currently at work finishing a book project on visual infrastructure in Latin America. Um, the continuation, our second part of this project, probably another book, specifically takes up water and visual infrastructures. Um, so yeah, without further ado. Thank you, um, Natalia, for curating this kind of amazing <laughs> It's just been so exciting to listen to things that are so, so different. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm you know, really feel an honor to be here. Thanks for, to Lori and Lon for making it possible. I feel like I should have the collaborator. I mean, I really need to be a phantom collaborator. Maybe will be my phantom collaborator for the purposes of this presentation. Okay. So um, the work I'm presenting is largely speculative. It's also very, very new. So in contrast, I think, to the uh, two former presentations, which are very developed projects, um, I'm just starting to think through water. And working through the films that I want to present here has led me to issues of body and surface, which is not what I set out to look for, but that's where it took me. So as you'll see, I'm still working really closely with the text I'm trying to think with. Um, and part of what I need to do, then, is um, move further away from them, I think. Um, so this project on water has emerged out of this book that I'm supposed to be finishing on infrastructures of visuality, and it carries forward my attempt to think about the visual form in infrastructural terms, so to think about the way the visual is deemed to carry information and meaning, but in this case in relation explicitly to water, and in a context in which water emerges or re-emerges as a loaded terrain on which the struggle between forms of extraction and a renewed language of the commons is played out. So an important part of this Struggle is a disagreement over what water is, a disjunction that shows up in the water is life formulation that is proliferated around indigenous and non-indigenous struggles over water access. Where the okay. Sorry. Good. Thank you. This is I was afraid this was a little too long, but that's go too fast. Okay. So the is establishes a holding ground that temporarily brings together two incommensurate worlds beyond metaphor. The for formulation doesn't simply mean that water is necessary to, or is the formulation of life, uh, although it can be read this way, but also that water is life. And if this is so, we might be talking about another kind of water and another kind of life. We may read this disjunction in terms of the Brazilian anthropologist Eduardo Viveiro de Castro's notion of equivocation. Viveiro de Castro argues that Amazonian cultures are marked by perspectivism rather than cultural relativism. So rather than assuming a single world that can be viewed in different ways, perspectivism implies the coexistence of different worlds as a consequence of different perspectives. In one example, Viveiro de Castro cites a Piro woman who responds to a mission teacher who's trying to convince her to prepare food for her water, for her child, sorry, with boiled water, by saying, so this is what the Piro woman says, perhaps that is true for people from Lima, but for us, people native to this place, boiled water gives diarrhea. Our bodies are different from your bodies. So Viveta Chicastro goes on to elucidate that, quoting, the pure water anecdote does not refer to another vision of the same body, but another concept of the body, non, a non-biological one. The problem being precisely its discrepancy from our own concept, notwithstanding their apparent homonymy. So equivocation, in which the same word, body, water, life, seems to refer to different things is not simply disagreement, misunderstanding, or mistake. It is a failure to understand that understandings are not necessarily the same, that they are not related to imaginary ways of seeing the world, but to the real worlds that are being seen. So instead of a situation in which one assumes a stable signified, body or water, which can be given different signifiers in different languages, the phenomenon of equivocation points to a view of different worlds where there is no common signifier. So water and the struggle over water might also be seen as a struggle then about how and where these worlds meet. What I'm trying to do in this water project is think through the conjunction of this problematization of water, right, the way it presents a problem both to politics and intelligibility, with the use of visual forms to present, stage, or access water. 
particularly since films, both fictional and documentary, have really been an important register through which these conflicts have been mainstreamed in Latin America. So the, the movie I want to start off with is a very mainstream commercial film. Um, so some questions follow from this, for me. How do visual forms present such problematization? What do they tell us about the work they perform in managing access to water? How does visuality matter? If water is constituted as a problem that we can witness through film, does it become something to be seen and pointed at? Its centrality to life suddenly abstracted and made visible? If so, does this problematization of water kill it? If we follow Lefebvre's critique of the rise of an optical and visual logic that accompanies the increasing production of abstract space under capitalism, might there be other ways of knowing, staged or projected by visual forms in relationship to water? And finally, might infrastructure open up new ways of thinking about water and visual forms? So my analysis in this piece is organized by two pairs of films. I start with Ikai Bolin's Even the Rain, because it is one of the more, more well-known fictional and commercial films to treat the water wars in Latin America, and it's constantly on different college syllabi. And I think it exemplifies the way attempts to represent conflicts over water also depends on a certain stable, stabilization and abstraction of water as a resource that can be contained in visually identifiable bodies and presented on screen. So it's a kind of foil of sorts against which I think to try to suggest what the other films do that are interesting. Um, so the other films embody water differently and also present different kinds of visual work. It's a short uh, animated film on Bolivian water works called Abuela Grisho and two short films on rivers. Carolina Carcelo's Friends of the Yuma and Paz Encina's Viento Sur. And I'm really mostly interested in the last film. That's where I'm, that's where I'm trying to think through. Okay, so first a little bit about warm, uh, water form and infrastructure. So in its liquidity and mutability, water carries with it a partial formlessness. Marked by constant physical transformation in form and movement, it is, as Veronica Strang says, a verb, which ranged from ice to stream, from vapor to rain, from fluid to steam. If water has been called an uncooperative commodity, one that is difficult to privatize, to contain and fence in in exchange for money, it is due to this lack of, fix lack of fixity and proper place. Thus, it is often through infrastructures, such as buckets, pipes, bottles, dams, and boats, that we access water, and it is also through such infrastructures that the means of accessing water can be privatized. Water as water does not come with a definitive body then, or its body is not pre-given in such a naming process, unlike water as river or pond or ocean. Indeed, naming water water abstracts it away from a body even as it stabilizes it or gives it a resting place in its fluid form. Water can become steam, but is not yet steam. Hence the estrangement generated by Michael Allaby's statement that weather consists mainly of water in one form or another. Or it might take us a second to cross the gap and recognize weather fluctuations broadly, not just rain, right? As so many redistributions and instances of the Earth's hydrological cycles. So if naming water water gives it a resting place in liquidity, so that it is not just a verb, but an infinitive which is waiting to be conjugated, but hasn't yet been, then it is halfway to form. But this fluidity is conjugated in relationship to, and its difference from, more stable and solid forms of embodiment. This is the point made by Stefan Halmreich, uh, an anthropologist, when he notes that the very fluidity of water is a rhetorical effect of how we think about nature and culture in the first place. Water's nature appears as both potentiality of form and uncontainable flux. It moves faster than culture, with culture often imagined, imagined in a land-based idiom grounded in the culture concepts origins in European practices and theories of agriculture and cultivation. So water as nature appears as that flowing substance that culture may be mobilized to channel. Think of canal, canal locks, dams, and irrigation networks. So that's the end of the comics. But can we think of water as something other than a flowing substance that is then channeled and even formed through culture? something other than, to borrow words from Imre Seisman's um, essay on oil, a material resource squeezed into a social form that pre-exists it, to understanding it as its self-form producing. And what practices of knowing might allow this shift to locating form or the formative otherwise? Rivers are not simply flowing water to be mobilized or channeled. They may be channeled otherwise, dredged or bound up, but their very name speaks of form. Even if the forms of water bodies uh, are given by external limits, 
where liquidity means the non-liquid in the form of shores. That their infrastructural is not a stretch. Rivers cut through land, dividing it. Their lens turns them into channels of mobility. Might water also be infrastructural? What might this mean? There are two preliminary aspects of infrastructure I want to signal by referring to John Durham Peters' analysis of elemental media and his really imaginative, marvelous clouds towards a philosophy of elemental media. While the main target of Peters' book is media rather than infrastructure per se, his notion of media is a specifically infrastructural one. So rather than in a restricted sense of media as a message or communication, his philosophical project restores the material environmental sense to media so that we hear once again its proximity to habitat and milieu. If media are environments, environments, so sea, fire, clouds, bodies, or Peters, can also be media. Thus Peters writes, quote, that once communication is understood not only as sending messages, certainly an essential function, but also as providing conditions for existence, media cease to be only studios and stations, messages and channels, and become infrastructures and forms of life. So, end quote. Importantly, however, they provide such conditions for existence by distributing and organizing the relationships of our worlds in a logistical sense. So for him, infrastructuralism suggests a way of understanding the work of media as fundamentally logistical. Logistical media, and he means things like clocks, towers, names, indexes, addresses, the census, money, and the zero. So he says, um, this is a quote from him, logistical media add to the leverage exerted by rec recording media that compress time, and by transmitting media that compress space. The job of logistical media is to organize and orient, to arrange people and property, often into grids. They both coordinate and subordinate, arranging relationships among people and things. Logistical media establish the zero points where the x and y axes converge. So returning to the question of water, to ask how water might be infrastructural and then, so therefore not simply elemental, right, not simply habitat, is about more than thinking of the ways it is necessary to and sometimes life. To know it through the optic of infrastructure also raises the question of how we interface with water and what difference this makes. Peters makes the point that it is the ship that makes the sea into a medium, a channel for traveling, fishing, and exploring. Without such an apparatus, we would not know this watery place, and the sea would be kind of be a, beyond the horizon of knowing. So we have no access to water outside our relationship to it, a relationship which is inescapably um, cultural, even one is, perhaps especially one, it has been imagined as nature. But the form of this relationship and the kinds of craft at stake can be varied. There are, as Vandana Shiva puts it, different possible water cultures. So what role do visual forms play in this relationship, and what kind of infrastructure of access are visual forms? So now I'm going to move to the first film, which is Igai Bonin's Even the Rain. It follows a transnational film crew involved in filming a Hollywood epic type moving in Bolivia about Bartolomé de las Casas and his denunciation of the human destruction wrought by the Spanish Empire. Now, it so happens that the, the moment that they pick to film their film coincides with the water wars of 2000. This is only relevant to them because Daniel, the Bolivian actor who plays the leader of the indigenous resistance to the Spaniards, takes a leadership role in the water wars. So the movie works to draw out a series of parallels between three structures of dispossession. The Spanish colonization of indigenous bodies, the privatization of water in Cochabamba, and the Spanish film crew's use of Bolivian's population as cheap landscape and cheap extras for the film and production. In this narrative, water enters essentially through a metaphorical structure. It works as a kind of stand-in for the way the current inhabitants of Bolivia are being treated as a natural resource from which surface, surface value can be extracted by the global film industry, just as international companies sought to extract surface water value from water. So water comes to be comes to the screen, therefore, as a kind of external input into our socio-cultural systems and histories, as Imer Zeman says of oil. As a natural resource defined by its use value, it was problematically out there, and just like Marx's narrative on primitive accumulation, it existed in a certain metabolic relationship to the human, but this access has not been blocked. So the title, Even the Rain, signals the crossing of a conceptual limit. Process of, of privatization of water, of course, not new. The selling of municipal water systems or the blocking of access to certain rivers or lakes are you know, old processes. But what is marked with particular outrage in the film is the expansion of such processes between water as stabilized, 
even if temporarily, in one container or another, right? groundwater, river, lake. And this, the expansion of this kind of uh, process into other parts of the water cycle to include water falling from the sky. How can ownership be claimed of rain? So Daniel, on a speech he gives to uh, mobilize a large crowd, pushes it yet further to include other scales and internal geographies that are part of the circulation of water, from droplet to ocean, trickle to flood, cup to lake. He says, well, they claim ownership of his tears, of his sweat, and his response is that they will only get his piss. Still, although an expanded sense of water then, scaled up to include rain and down to include sweat and tears, exists in the film, by and large, water is important insofar as it is drinking water, as a necessary support and input to human life. As a resource, it is, as Cecilia Chen points out, discursively contained and conceptually ordered, even as it is physically extracted, treated, and piped to where we live. So an alternative to such a way of ordering water can be found in the short animated film Abuela Grisho, which also addresses the Bolivian water wars, but problematizes water differently by personifying it in the figure of a grandmotherly water spirit, based on Ayodeo mythology. The short film is the product of a cultural exchange between Bolivia and Denmark, and was written by eight Bolivian students as part of the animation workshop under the artistic direction of French cartoonist Denis Chapon. The plot line of the short follows the water spirit, yeah. who first wanders and waters the land freely, both cultivated lands, but also lands without human presence, is then captured, hooked into a factory, and forced to squeeze out water in a bottle form. Mm -hmm. I think that's my next one, yeah. The constriction of flow into certain ordered and profitable channels, which pass strictly through a relationship to the human, causes drought to proliferate. No, I don't have a drought. Uh, predictably, the situation is, re is resolved by a giant storm and a flood that she brings up, which washes away the various forms of containment and allows her and the water to water freely again. So, embodying water differently has a number of effects. The forms by which you perceive water, as bodies of water, are both foregrounded as such in the film, as a grandmother's body, as well as estranged in a human body. While we might understand the grandmother's body as another sort of resting state or flow of water in the world, it is never fully uh, bound or contained as such, but marked by leakiness and movement. Outside pieces of her body follow her like supplements, so that she is sometimes, but not always, <coughs> this one, she's not, um, followed by, uh, no, she's uh, sometimes trails clouds and rain and snow. This fluctuating externality of her body, or instability of her body, accompanies a certain unpredictability in the effects of her presence. The second effect of the personification of water as a subject of source, therefore, is to set up water as having a certain logic and agency of its own, apart from its relationship to humans, as something other than useful or as exceeding anthrop anthropocentric ideas of service. Useless waters are less intelligible, and as uh, Cecilia Chen says again, agents of troublesome, unpredictable, and transformational energies, energies that are integral to risky processes of becoming, including, but certainly not limited to, death, the water forms that come in and out of relationship with her, so clouds, rains, snow, storms, floods, do so in ways that seem both alternately willed and inadvertent, never fully controlled or predictable. Um, in one early scene, she is shown accidentally bringing a flood upon a small village that has invited her to stay there temporarily, and they kick her out of the village because um, she can't stay there. So staying still, or trying to stop the transformation and errancy of water, or binding it to a human, even if in this first instance it is done in an open or generous way, with a gift of food to her, and an invitation to stay, is thus shown to be potentially dangerous. This embodiment also changes the kind of work visuality is made to perform as the medium in which a certain knowledge is delivered. Even though, although even the rain turns the lens on the process of producing films, and the unequal power and labor structures attending it, it does not question the visual form itself as a means of access. And indeed, the exploitative structure of the fiction film company is contrasted with a documentary eye of a woman called Maria, who is tasked with following or filming the, the making of the film. Right? And so as she's doing this, she starts to register the tensions that the rest of the crew want to ignore. So Maria acts as a kind of stand-in for the film that we're watching, one that is organized by a logic of witnessing and revelation, where these parallel structures of exploitation are made visible. This logic of um, witnessing leads to a scene near the end of a film, in which the film's producer Costa opens up a gift given to him by Daniel, which is his bottle of water. 
I think, I mean, this is a, it's, it's a terrible scene, right? Um, I think it's meant to bring together two radically different understandings of water. It is meant to stage something like an occupation in British Catholic terms. So, so thus, for example, to offer Daniel water as a gift seems to point at forms of value that exceed market economy. Um, insofar as the quantity of water is minimal, it also exceeds any sense of use value, right? It's only a gift. Gosse's response to this is to use the Quechua word yaku, uh, gesturing perhaps at the possibility of a faithful translation as something other than linguistic equivalence to agua. At the same time, the presentation of yaku is embodied in the vial and mirrors its st stabilization as something that can be presented on screen. And there's a, there's a kind of very slow shot, right? It's kind of constantly showing you the water within the vial of water, and we're constantly looking at it for a long time. The point is not only that a commodity logic returns to haunt the scene because it appears in the form of a bottle, but that the movie stabilizes water as something that can be presented visibly. And I think as I was putting together the slides, I noticed that the very next scene, when he says Yaku, um, this is the next scene, which I think is really interesting because um, it suggests both a point of connection and disjunction, right? So he recognizes the word, he looks back at him, of course, their eyes don't necessarily meet, but if they were to meet, it would be through the eyes, right? So I think there's a kind of emphasis on the visible or the visual as a kind of important carrier. So the drive to make water visible and to abstract it mimics the very processes that the attempts to problematize. The body of the grandmother water, on the other hand, neither contains nor makes water visible the same way. Although we are sometimes given visual images of rain or floods on screen, often we are also just given the body of the wola herself, who stands in for water, but where liquid water is not visible as such. So she both is and is not water. And water is not exclusively her, so others can become water too. So at the moment of the storm, the bodies of the protesting peasants and the army that are fighting take the visual form of clashing waves. So this is the people protesting in black and white are the army. So they, they also become water, in a sense. So the destruction remains. Okay, let's go on to the next, the rivers. So water shows up in Pasencino's short film Bethesur as a large unnamed river on the edge of which a conversation is taking place between two brothers, sometime during the dictatorship of Alfredo Sposar in Paraguay. Looming over the brothers is this threat of being detained, tortured, and killed. The form of their opposition to the regime isn't clear or is purposely generic. Basically, they just talk about a cause they don't want to betray. One brother wants to cross the river and sees it as a line of flight to safety because the far bank of the, of the river represents another country. The other one doesn't. And he throws up throughout the movie different impediments to his brother's expectations to cross. So at first he says, some, you know, sometimes he just refuses to answer or he delays his answer. When he does answer, he says, no, they need to wait for the weather to change. He doesn't want to steal a boat to cross the river because that's a stain on his honor. He says that they may die on the river. And finally, that crossing and being far away is a fate worse than death or imprisonment. So while the film is called Viento Sur, where the title refers to a change in the weather, which might or may not allow them to cross, it is the river rather than the wind that occupies the horizon of the film. It looms as a threshold against which they have written decision. As a natural barrier, it presents certain material difficulties to the brothers. But as a nation-state frontier, it promises a change in social and political conditions once traversed. The waiting ends when one brother decides to cross the river. And while the other brother does not follow, he accepts a becoming other that involves changing their names so that they won't each betray each other under possible capture and torture. While the one who leads takes the name of their father, the one who stays inscribes himself in a different genealogy, becoming Ramon del Rio, and giving finally the river a quality of a name. So through the name, it also takes on the figure of the ground something against which and out of which his new identity emerges. In giving us this river, Encina draws on older archives of water, water embodiment, which offer a more fractious problematization of our access to water, away from thresholds of usefulness and intelligibility. But it is not that her river specifically opposes water understood as resource, or water as standing reserve. Her river is much more open-ended than that. Um, By way of contrast, we might consider Magdalena Gomez's Barry's analysis of the work Yuma, the Land of Friends, by multimedia artist Carolina Caicedo. Gomez Barry's characterizes Caicedo's work as an exploration of its relationship and social discussion and the 
construction of dams and reservoirs around the Magdalena River and Crossroads. Against extractive viewpoints that drives dam construction, according to Gomez Barrios, Caicedo seeks to lift, lift up multifaceted vernacular practices and forms of perception that are devalued or submerged through the cognitive injustice that reproduces symmetries. This includes for Gomez Barrios the construction or evocation of submerged forms of perception such as inanimate forms outside the range of the human eye. And it leads to what Goldman Barrys calls a fish eye at this time. In so doing, according to Goldman Barrys, Caicedo invites the few viewer to relate to the river as a sentient being rather than extractive or modern. If even the rain denounces predatory forms of extraction while relying on practices and forms of perception that might be said to uphold an extractive viewpoint, Caicedo shifts practices of perception leaving us see from within and underneath water, rather than visually fencing water in through its enclosure and fire. It kind of came on the screen. Thus, in Sina's river is different, however. The field's coordinates are oriented not by the economic logic of extractivism, but by an impressive power that has taken political form of our human world. And there is no effort to express a literary perspective as a rights-bearing subject, or as a friend or family, with its own memory and forms of expression. Instead, for the brothers who hover on the edge of the river, the, it, it evokes this absolute alterity that Jules Michelet evoked um, or attributed to the sea. So Michelet writes, for all terrestrial animals, water is the non-respirable element, ever heaving but inevitably asphyxiating enemy, the fatal and eternal barrier between the two worlds. And, Michelet. and it is not just any death. Right? So the brother who wants to say says, it is one thing to die in the river, but another to be buried there. If I die, I want to be found so women can mourn for me. Not even God thinks about those who are at its bottom. So to die and be buried in the river is to fall out of the possibility of memory and mourning. To cross the river, either horizontally across the surface to somewhere else, or to cross it from the surface to the bottom by sinking, implies a radical form of becoming a loss of self. The association between the river and death, in the words of the brothers, matched with a blurry shot of a dead fish floating in shallow water. This fish is both ultimately a stand-in for them, an analogous representation of death in the river, but also precisely not them, insofar as Don Brother describes the fear of becoming other through the image of becoming fish. He says, we might become faces that go into the dark. So fish, fish become born by the stream, by the current. Um, so rather than constructing a fish epistemology, to become fish in Basantina's films to cross into this other world. Importantly, I think, such alternity is not organized around a divide between the human and nature. So the river is important in the film both as a natural barrier and a political barrier, and neither the river nor wind are something that we really call nature. So when one brother declares that, um, he said the, the wind of August is um, treacherous, it's, gonna, it's not going to help us. Uh, I think in that statement, the wind takes on a certain opaque agency, one that's analogous to human agency, but that is figured as indifferent to or hostile to the needs of the brothers. Right? So it's, it's, it could be like a human, um, but isn't quite. In both forms, however, the visual approach to river water is marked by opacity. Gomez's term fisheye epistemology is taken from one particular scene in which the camera dips below the surface of the water. And I'm going to just show you, okay, so in Caicedo's film, the, the, river kind of, the river appears in many different forms. Right? Um, these are some of the ones. It's, um, there's a person also drawing the kind of shape of a river. You have a kind of bird's eye view. And you also have this one that Gomez Babies talks a lot about in which the river is inverted. But the fisheye epistemology comes from the so the way Gomez Babies describes this is, uh, we accept the fact that our sight is obstructed by the cloudy water, the pieces of leaves blocking the view, fleeting away, as small and then larger bubbles force us to try to find something familiar in the visual muck. In long takes that submerge the camera completely in the muddy water, the field of vision hovers in that transitional zone between the translucent and opaque, between oxygen bubbles and swirling currents. So the river muck blocks our visual access, decentering the logocentric perspective of the human for Gomez Babies. And so we are forced to see into this muck of what has usually been rendered in linear and transparent visualities. 
So this back to Pasensina. Pasensina's film also refuses linear and transparent visualities. But in this case, it's partly done by backing away from the visual itself as a central means of transmission. Since, like in Sina's most well-known Amaka Paraguasha, it is the sonic and not the visual track that really drives this film. And what we're allowed to see on screen bears a disjunctive relationship to the oral word flow of words that we follow. So basically there's a conversation between two lovers, and then we see kind of the images that accompany the conversation. Like music, the principal thread is given by the cadence and rhythm of the voices in this contrapuntal exchange of words. It is not clear whether we ever see the brothers. Instead, what we see in grainy, Im grainy images are shots with a tenuous relationship to their situation. So for example, a hut on the edge of the river, which might serve as a hideout, a boat, which might be the boat that we want to take across the river, images of boys playing on the edge with sticks, which could be them at an early time of their life. So we can imagine some images, at least, as bearing a kind of indexical relationship to the words we hear. But we're also showing images that are much less clear. Uh, one washing clothes, two girls by the river, two spent shoes, a cut orange and a knife, and a boy creating um, forms of sand and mud, wiping them out. Two boys with buckets of water, etc. All these images acquire a kind of thickness and opacity in which meaning, coordination, and connection is not fully transferred but withheld and tethered to its own materiality. Or put otherwise, the images themselves take on a character of voicings within a polyphonic temporal sequence which includes heterogeneous sounds, whispers, a woman's voice on a loudspeaker, a woman praying. In the process, um, visuality takes on the quality of a material surface rather than a medium through which to access something else. The images in Gento Sura are grainy, and the screen is often dark, or black, or alternately luminous. Um, the film is punctuated periodically by thunder rumbling and by lightning. This is one of those examples. It's the kind of sequence here where the boy with the drying images is interrupted by a kind of flash of lightning, and then moves to the two shoes. So this lightning, which illuminates the screen, is a kind of just light event, which spills or sweeps across the surface of the screen. It evokes, in this sense, Juliana Bruno's argument about the emergence of a new kind of haptic materiality at play in contemporary screens, which for her can no longer be likened to windows or mirrors, but are instead reconfigured as a new kind of surface, one with layers and tissues containing strata, sediments, and deposits. Basensina's visual work, um, starting with her initial installation of images of people projected onto a hammock, which is what later gave rise to La uh, Maca Paraguasha, works precisely with the screen as a new kind of surface, as something closer to a sheep or a drape or a hat in this case. So, borrowing words that Bruno uses to describe the filmography of Wang Karabai, we might also say that in Sur, we're not asked to see clearly through the fabric of the screen, for several coatings and thinner surfaces are built up out of different materials and are folded together in visual pleading and editing. If, as Bruno suggests, this new screen membrane functions as a kind of connective tissue, in the case of Basensina's film, we might say that visuality and water interface or touch through surface. The visual images layered upon the running stream of voices in the film present themselves as analogous to water, which also appears largely as surface in the film. As rain falling and the river lapping against rocks, or as simply the kind of ripple sheen of the surface. So, a surface is the edge of liquidity. It's a form, but not an embodiment, because I think surfaces are open. So why does surface suggest not only a screen surface, so not only a kind of, um, not, not only the way that um, Bruno talks about it, but also an other side, and this is part of what I'm interested in, how Basin um, Sina creates surfaces. The opacity in her film is not a function of muck, not simply a blockage or refusal of the visual and, and its mastery, supposedly, as much as a kind of membrane through which we touch another side. Um, and here I kind of go to, so this is where I guess, back to, this is where I guess, this is where I'm trying to figure out where I'm going still, right? But uh, there's a comment, uh, there's a, a passage by De Sarto where he's talking about everyday news that seemed really interesting to me to think about what Pasensina is doing. So he says that every day is simultaneously fleeting and permanent, the night side of societies, or a dark sea from which successive institutions emerge. In maritime immensity on which socioeconomic and political structures appear as ephemeral islands. Escaping the imaginary totalizations produced by the eye, he writes, 
The everyday has a certain strangeness that is not surface, or whose surface is only its upper limit, outlining itself against the visible. So Basantina's work with images establishes the visual as this kind of upper limit, or surface. Um, you may interact with water at its, at its limit, or its edge, and kind of touch it, but it stretches back and beyond, away from threshold, thresholds of usefulness and intelligibility. And the last thing I just want to say is I was originally thinking of it as a kind of horizon, but I'm moving away from thinking of this horizon. I think precisely as a, as a surface, it's too close to be something like a horizon. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't kind of order the world in the same way that a horizon would, right? But there's something about it, its openness. We touch the water and there's, some, there's something behind that we're not getting to and we can't cross into, right? So it's open, but we're there at the edge of it. And but that is what's really interesting to me and how she um, portrays the river. So um, that's, that's it. Thank you so much, uh, Johnson, for sharing this wonderful set of. Uh, Excellent. <laughs> um, thank you uh, for share, sharing this wonderful set of theorizations that indeed highlight the critical and ethical dimensions at stake in any and all definition of water. And as your paper, an expanse of water, ways of knowing. At first, I kept not saying that. I, I, I thought an expanse knowing um, ways of water, <laughs> which is also a interesting title. Um, but it reminds us of a, that an important part of the struggle articulated by water hinges precisely on problematizing <coughs> what water is, a gesture that places epistemology and semiotics at the forefront of your speculations on on Lightning's Even Rain, Basensinas Sur, the animated short of Rodrigo, and on Garcelos Yuma, like friends. Uh, as you also suggest, how and where we attempt to bridge the abortives in our conflictual understandings and sensing of water yields in turn a rich set of questions on the nature of the artwork, on its critical capacity, and in the realm of the political, insofar as water is never just a form or figuration, and we must ultimately come to terms with the multiple materialities conveyed in a murky pond stillness, a river's current, or an ocean's expanse. So at a global level, your paper struck me as concerned with methods. Methods of knowing, methods of grappling with difference, with opacity, and ultimately, methods of remaining with the complications that arise when representing, articulating, and even feeling water. So the critical valences, the critical valences of these films for me emerge precisely as methodological suggestions in the artwork's intimations towards an expansive mode of knowing predicated on denaturalizing perception, um, as you discussed. And so the following are just a series of questions inspired by my reading of your paper, so in the hopes of you know, starting a conversation around some of the issues you raised. Um, and I wanted to begin by asking a question concerning your own method. Um, if you want, I can just you know, give you all the questions, and then you can have an answer um, in any order you wish. So. So yeah, my first question concerns your method, and I really like that you begin by categorizing your own essay as um, largely speculative. And given the this, given this centrality of knowing in your essay, as well as your discussion of the opaque, I wonder how your reading and critical practice works in a semblance of water, or as you say, perhaps analogous to water. And, you know, um, would you propose, say, this horizontal mode of speculation as an alternative to some form of vertical or even penetrative form of argumentation that just doesn't hold when thinking about water? Um, similarly, on page three, you evoke um, you go to Chicago and discuss that um, equivocation, and this is I'm quoting, um, equivocation in which the same word, body, water, life, seems to refer to different things is not simply disagreement, misunderstanding, or mistake, or mistake of some kind. It is a failure to understand that understandings are necessarily not the same and they are not related to the imaginary ways of seeing the world, but to the real worlds that, um, that are being seen. So um, considering this, a question that emerged for me at this point um, was, and you know, in, in relation to your discussion of Yentosura and Yuma, which seemed to destabilize water's easy material or figurative extraction is, can we consider their Deliberately, deliberate frustration of the ocular of ocular knowledge 
as a possible method or perhaps a tactic that opens up the discussion of equivocation by considering the role of the senses, the sense of sight being particularly addressed here given the film medium, but generally speaking, how does this way of knowing opened up by water depend on a critical intervention on global north articulations of sense certainty and perception? That is, are we doomed to the incommensurability of these worlds apart, or can we arrive at a theory of the artwork able to elaborate some sort of relational comments in which semblance space highlights and opens up possible encounters among worlds given art's function as critique? So how do these feel perhaps, perhaps like stage and encounter um, that you know, might expand our understanding of the publication? Um, furthermore, you write that, quote, um, Casedo invites the viewer to relate to the river as a sentient being rather than uh, an extractable commodity. Um, if he, the rain denounces predatory forms of extraction while relying on practices and forms of perception that might be said to uphold an extractive viewpoint, Casedo shifts, practi um, shifts practices of perception, making a see from within and understand water. Um, so again, it's another point where I saw um, a possible discussion about you know, the senses and the relationship between these artworks and um, a certain certainty uh, about what visuality can do or what visuality ought to do um, that I would like to hear more about. Um, then on page six you ask, so how might something like oil or water be understood not simply as material, material squeezed into a human determined form but as itself form producing and what practices of knowing might allow us to shift the location uh, to locating form or the formative otherwise. Um, so another rich set of issues raised by your paper, which certainly are of interest in my own thinking through water, is related to problems that fall into the realms of figuration, knowledge, and perhaps even ethical action. So your work articulates a relationship among these three, and as it suggests water, as the infrastructure where we feel and know, quote, the struggle about how and, wor and where uh, worlds meet. Following from my first question, um, I would like to hear more about the role of epistemology in your argument's approach to the culturally and historically determined problem of water. Your argument suggests that knowledge, or the conflict staged as an epistemological conflict, is perhaps a precondition to other forms of ethical action opened up through this mode of critique. Do these practices of knowing and gender art and gender artworks expresses, expressive of this knowing otherwise, or are these artworks themselves intervening in ways that lead us to question our ethics of knowledge production and ultimately ethical action with regards to you know, this matter of water? Is it uh, a problem then of addressing a mode of relating to this um, object of inquiry that produces other questions? And do these artworks ultimately suggest paths of knowing otherwise. Furthermore, um, when he suggests the possibility of water being itself an infrastructure, both materially, as in the waters that divide and segment um, continental mass, or even the ocean that divides and bridges islands in an archipelago, um, and yet it's also an infrastructure for figuration, a mode of thought, as you suggest. So I wanted to ask about um, you know, what you refer to as interfacing and how you know, the, the role of interface in, in, in your thoughts. And I took these to mean the ways of you know, relating to whatever form of thought and sensing, um, or relating to thought and sensing, or whatever new ways of knowing are opened up by water. And so you write that, quote, to know water through the optic of infrastructure also raises questions of how we interface with water and what difference this makes. Um, and I was really struck by this wonderful conversation on, inter on interface and a question driven by how I myself um, think about water in the context of the Caribbean, the context of the transatlantic slave trade, is the following. Um, can we think of this capacity for or possibility of interfacing itself as determined by a set of cultural and historical perspectives that inevitably ground this infrastructure in questions of historical inequity and violence as potentially reproducing these inequalities and disparities with regards to access to that you know, infrastructure of thought that water might, um, might hold. What I mean is that that we interfacing with water is predicated on some given historically constituted relationship that, um, to this liquid that in turn modulates how we approach the very nature of the infrastructure, um, how that infrastructure emerges, who has access to that infrastructure for thought, um, who or what is barred in any way, material um, or otherwise, from thinking about water. 
Um, and you know, the thought generally was inspired by my own reading of Christina Sharp's In the Wake on Blackness and Being, in which you know, water has its own um, way of, of being figuratively active and an infrastructure for thought. Um, and she too derives and articulates a mode of inquiry by thinking about water as both a figural zone for reading the wakes of slavery's ongoing disaster, um, and as a very infrastructure for a blackened knowledge that speaks of an ontological condition disclosed by the Atlantic Ocean waters. Does your project also consider an ontological dimension, and what kinds of being emerge from looking and thinking about um, water differently? And finally, <laughs> uh, finally, you know, uh, I wanted to end my set of questions by and opening up the space for discussion by addressing the role of the opaque and opacity in both your reading of films and generally within your own theoretical framework. This might tie back to the idea of speculation um, that I started with. Um, you write that quote, Fasencina's film also refuses linear and transparent visualities. In her case, however, this is partly done by backing away from the visual itself as central as the central means of transmission. Um, and then on page 17, you write, all the images acquire a kind of thickness and opacity in which meaning, coordination, and connection is not fully transferred, but withheld and tethered to its own materiality. So generally, I would love to hear more about the role of the opaque and opacity, if you have more thoughts to share, and, um, and the relationship that that might hold with water, and generally with your own um, argument or speculation. Do you see the figural infrastructure allowed by water as conducive to adequately working with the opaque? That is to say, as a way of sketching out a method of ethically addressing and knowing opacity, or as a means or media able to articulate the yields of the opaque? Here, I am thinking about Buisson, whose work hinges so fervently on the championing of the opaque. He mentions that, quote, there's a fundamental injustice in the worldwide spread of, the transpa of transparency in Western thought, and that one could even speak of racism or other forms of structural violence as oppressive disavowals of the fundamental opacity of the other. So he believes that reclaiming the rights of the opaque is perhaps one of the fundamental tasks of thought and art. Do you see this formal, these formal tactics in Basencina and Gaiseva, perhaps, as forms of rendering opaque that participate in this act of reclaiming, in a way? And is there an ethical dimension that played already in these films in relation to how they address the opaque? Mm -hmm. That's a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> and you can, Thank you for that. <laughs> okay. Um, You start off asking about the speculative. So I guess I think I'm going to start there. Um, and I, I, I briefly told you, I, I mean, part of that is coming out of, um, I, I, I've been asked to write a piece by a friend of mine on um, women in theory and my relationship to theory. And I've been trying to formulate for myself, what is my relationship to theory? Um, and I think what, I've, what I'm coming towards articulating is that it's speculative. Or I like, to, I like to think about theory as speculative because then I'm not tied to, in the same relationship to an archive in the same way, right? Which is, I have really um, troubled relationships to archives. Uh, I tend to um, part of, I, I tend to kind of be eclectic and move around a lot, and part of that has to do with this uh, intense relationship to the formation of knowledge as an archives, right? So thinking about the speculative um, and, and, and being able to write things that I don't, I don't feel like I need to believe in that. It doesn't have to be a truth claim to what I'm writing. I'm, I'm thinking, I'm trying to figure out what I think as I write, and I'm trying to kind of let the process of writing then be, take, it, take me where I'm not necessarily expecting to go. And so that's part of what I've been trying to do with this project, is to kind of let myself do this new kind of writing. Um, and that's why I called it speculative. And, so, and part of it is, you know, this feeling that I am kind of, um, <coughs> kind of wading through water and trying to figure out what that means and what that feels like as I move, and it's taking me places I'm not expecting. So, is it a reading practice analogous to what? I mean, I think, because I'm also trying to think um, ever more about our own writing practices, I'm trying to, as the place of thinking, as opposed to having a thought that I articulate ahead of time and that somehow is transmitted through writing. Like, one, I guess one, I hadn't thought of that before, but one could think that there's something about that that's related to the kind of surface work that I see in Basantina, maybe. 
Um, certainly, so, is there, so in terms of what you said about the kind of ocular knowledge and senses, I mean, so this comes out of a project that I'm developing right now where I'm trying to think of visual forms as a kind of infrastructure. And what I mean by that is I, think I see a kind of expansion and spread of visual forms as the things that carry meaning and connection and sense increasingly. So much of our ways of connecting our labor practices, forms of governance, are, are, are being funneled or channeled through visual forms. I mean, even down to the simple, you know, sent texting and sending people images through phones, right? And so I've been thinking of that as a kind of thickening of visual infrastructures in the world. And I'm interested in, and so and to the same extent that, let's say, when traffic gets funneled through a highway, it, it rearranges the territory around it. I think it's, it's rearranging, let's say, our relationship to senses and other forms of, of let's say, forms of relationality or forms of communication that um, could take place, right? So that it's, it's, um, it's creating a kind of um, gravity effect, right? Things are being funneled increasingly. And part of my interest is, okay, what do films do with that? What do films do with the fact that there are also visual objects in this kind of word? Where, visual, where visuality is taking on this kind of increasing new functions, right? And so there I say there's some movies that I think tend towards thick visuality, and other movies that then tend towards what I call thin visuality. And for me, Passancina is one of those places where I'm working through what thin visuality means. And I think of it as this kind of backing away from the visual as like the principal means of transmission. And Passancina's work, she does it particularly through um, the, the, the sonic, the sonic track. Right? Like that is my, it, it carries the film. And the visual, it's not that, the, it, that's not, it's, not that it's not visual, but the visual is not the main means of transmission. And that to me is important. I'm just trying to figure out exactly what that means. So um, I think there are probably others, but that's the way that I've been thinking about it in terms of um, Fascinacino. I guess in terms of the river as infrastructure, um, I think part of what interests me, and this again, I'm, this, I'm kind of, I, I'm, what if we think of the river as a kind of zero? Is part of my question to myself. So, I mean, it's infrastructural to the extent that it's a, it's a national barrier, but it's also a physical barrier. So it's kind of organizing the relationship to space, right? So there's that aspect of the river. Um, and I'm trying to think of the river as a kind of zero, let's say, kind of logistical on some level, but not as a horizon necessarily. So I, I don't really know where to go from there because that's what I've kind of, I've hit a wall there. Um, and I'm not sure, if, so this is part of the speculative. I'm not sure if actually that's productive. I have to, I have to see. Productive to, 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 to think about water in that way. But part of it is trying to think of ways in which the formative comes from somewhere outside. Um, not just us pouring water into containers and giving it form. So, what ways is there a kind of formative quality to our relationship to water? Um, and I, and I can't remember the other questions. <laughs> So maybe I'll just um, end there, and then if you remind me, if it comes back up again, I'll take note again. Okay. And maybe you can also open up the yeah, conversation to the yeah. questions that. Comments. Perhaps I'd also like you more about, um, you know, to remind you one of my questions on the I mean, it's part of what you suggested in, in, in the work that these, that these films are doing, but also um, alongside this idea of the speculative, um, this idea of the opaque or knowing the opaque or approaching you know, this, this other way, a different way of knowing um, how, does, how do you imagine you know, this, this kind of approach to uh, be an ethical way of really being, given that you know, the possibility of being less ethical. Yeah, because I learned something I was going to say. Um, I think that, so, I think that the opacity that, that um, Gomez Vargas sees in Caicedo's work is really different from the kind of opacity that I see in um, Pasantina's work. I think part of, I felt like I had, the, the Caicedo is kind of a more recent insertion into this process, and I felt I kind of needed to because she was working in terms that was so similar to mine, but I thought that what I was trying to do was really different, actually, from what Gomez Vargas was doing. And part of what I, is that I mean her the, the her analysis of 
I said this work is structured completely around a kind of extractivist, not extractivist binary. And it seems to me that even though she's kind of uh, trying to find alternative forms of perception in Kaisilo's work, the fact that it's um, so organized around this kind of non-extractive binary actually, so then extraction actually becomes the kind of horizon through which water is seen. And, and to me that that's limiting in a way that I find Basensin's work is not. So, so the opacity there is simply like, I won't let you see because seeing is a form of mastery. And I think that that's not, that's not the uh, Pasensina's project. So I think Pasensina's project is much more open. I think it's also related to kind of much older, there are older archives of relationships to what, of course, there's, the time, there's lots of, um, you know, the, the, the archives of our relationship to kind of rivers and oceans and ponds and so on. She's drawing on not a particularly indigenous archive, but a kind of rural Paraguayan one. Of course, her, her films are all in Guarani. But, um, but this is the kind of national language in Paraguay, so it's not specifically organized around a kind of indigenous Western binary either, right? Um, and so I think there's a kind of openness to Pasensina's work with the river that is really different from the way I see Gomez Bacchus closing down Caicedo's work. I'm not sure that this is part of Caicedo herself, which is Gomez Bacchus reading of Caicedo. So the opacity that I see in Pasensina is more about um, it's like a withdrawal, it's a form of withdrawal from, as opposed to kind of, you, you could, I'm not gonna let you see. It's like sight does something else. It, 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 sight becomes something more like sound, let's say, I think, in Pasensina's work, because she's so interested, and she talks about this, that um, um, music is really the kind of, uh, it's a kind of structuring principle of a lot of her work, right? So rhythm and voice and noise. So, um, it, the visual is almost turned into a different kind of sense there. Mm -hmm. And it's not a question of just access or not access, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the kind of materiality she gives to the visual I think is really interesting. And that's why I was trying to make a kind of analogy between the, the surface, the kind of surface, um, which is really different from going below the surface and trying to um, take on a different perspective, right? A kind of fish eye perspective, which in some ways presumes a kind of access to what a fish eye perspective would be. But I think Basensina doesn't do that. She keeps on she, we're always like on this side of something that's like larger mm -hmm. and that we don't have access to but that we're in relationship with it and touching. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I would say one's more ethical than the other. I think that there's a kind of, to me, in terms of the way I can think, oh, Pasantina opens up on possibilities for thought and when I read Gomez Gavis, like I see what she's doing, but for me, I feel like closing it down. Mm -hmm. of kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. it, it seems also that the, the thing, what you refer to as in visuality and the work of someone like that, um, also comes up her relationship uh, with experimental cinema and video, which she also names as kind of her the, or the interest, uh, her first interest in the visual medium that she kind of leaves possibility of being a musician, a composer, etc. right? So that sound being the structural, but that the, the lesson in, um, learned from experimental cinema of the 70s and 80s and the emergence of video is also kind of looking for non-narrative mm -hmm. relationships to the visual. Mm -hmm. And that non-narrative relationship to the visual perhaps is um, related to the question of opacity and water itself. You know, in the sense that water is very present in all of her work somehow, right? The her first film is like, is it going to rain? Is it not going to rain? So most of the soundscape is the storm that announces the future water that never quite comes, etc. You can trace it in all the films. But so that brings us back to the first part of your presentation and the question of water as infrastructure. Um, for some, the water as non-infrastructure for others, right? And I think that a, perhaps an anal analogy could be made of that move that experimental cinema and video established with like a, the domain of the moving image having been put through the film medium into a kind of infrastructure of storytelling, Etc. versus a kind of breaking away from that infrastructure through the moments of experimental cinema and video. Right, so that past is actually in, perhaps in dialogue with that. And I, I don't know, I, I started thinking about that relationship 
uh, between the opacity, infrastructure, and thinness. Um, it would be more of a comment to question. Yeah, I think. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I was just uh, thinking about your work in the Brazilian Northeast, um, which is certainly a super different uh, place than uh, the classes coming from. But you know, what's interesting about water there is that in many ways it looks like it doesn't exist, but it is in dialoguing in some way with rock, right? It, for in many kinds of indigenous thinking that. Um, the, the rock defines water to some extent, both are living beings, right? And, uh, but it looks often water is not uh, on the surface, but it's hugely present within the rock. And in fact, healers and diviners, people like that, can open the rock. And when the rock opens, the water inside it is alive, but it's also almost um, infinite. And so the whole, maybe one way of thinking about water is what it's circumscribed by, which is a hard way to think about it, right? Because it's so immense, and in some places it defines everything else, like in the Amazon, right? But it seems to me that maybe thinking if there are things that hold it in, but also who thinks that it's alive and how does it, rocks too are alive uh, for some people, right? And so how do these things, relate to each other and how do they in some way um, allow one to think about um, different sorts of relationships right, between these forms but also obviously with people because often it's human blood that can open a rock in which there is a great amount of water. But anyway, very different but um, the thinking of your great work uh, in the uh, Thank you for that. Yeah, part of this project has it does take me back to the Brazilian Northeast and mm. talks about water scarcity. So right. um, yeah, and part of what interests me is the kind of ways of figuring absence of water, but water is completely con so invisible, but, it's invisible. But, but organizing life completely right. to the extent that the, the control, the kind of political control of water in the Northeast is what controls everything. Right. 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 So it's a kind of mark. Um, but, but, um, there's this idea of the kind of market the desert as structuring like human society and kind of politics in certain areas where water is scarce. Yeah. And so that, yeah, that's part of this project is thinking that. And then mm -hmm. how how that gets, so there's a really interesting movie called Arido Movie mm -hmm. by Nido Ferreira, um, which is about the Northeast. And I think the way that he represents absence of water and kind of, and kind of relationship to that mm -hmm. is, is amazing. Mm -hmm. What's his name? I don't know. Nido Ferreira. Uh -huh. Yeah, and the movie's called Arido Movie. That's great. Yeah. Okay. So I'm sort of hesitating on bringing this up because you provide so many fascinating objects that you're working with and I'm wanting to bring in a lot of presence in as um, installation projects which you didn't mm -hmm. talk about. But it seems to me like it, it could be really interesting to, to think through. Um, you know, this question of surface and interface, um, comments about archives, and um, even your, your turning to the web, uh, optical and logistics of um, creating abstract space. And that's her, her work with the Archives of Terror, in which she um, projects images. And the moment I'm thinking of is when she's projecting an image of um, someone who's built onto water. Um, and so that, I maybe just to hear you talk a little bit about that, if, if you're familiar enough with that. Yeah, I am actually. I saw it when I was in this film uh, just recently. And she projects also onto Earth. She has two parallel lines where she projects images of dead people onto surface of water, but also um, onto kind of mounds of Earth, yeah, which is really interesting. Yeah, I haven't brought, I haven't brought that into it. I think, I mean, she's, she's constantly thinking about water and the river, right? And so part of what I'm trying to figure out, and this is, 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 is exactly what role water is playing in, in kind of her work. Um, and, and, she, and, and I'm not going to say too much more about that. But yes, I definitely, I mean, that's, 
it's a really interesting thing. And she, I mean, I think she's so attentive to services, which is part of what I, why I think that she's like turning the visual into kind of a material other kind of thing. It does a different kind of work, right? Um, and, you know, and, and to me, that's analogous to her projecting the hammocks, right? I just, what I showed you is a kind of thing, um, images from that installation in Asuncion, where she projects the people kind of lying down on these hammocks, right? So she's really aware of kind of um, images as, you know, um, I guess in relationship to different kinds of surfaces, and as itself a kind of surface. So that she, that's part of the kind of way in which she creates her own works, right? So it's not only water surfaces. <coughs> Um, but then I think that somehow she sees water through surface, and that becomes the kind of lens, the optic, um, as opposed to being below or on it. Mm -hmm. anyway, that, that was not a very good answer. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, we're going to take a break. And we've got a few different things. Thank you.